Oral questions. Questions orales. Alors... The Honourable Member for Charlebourg au Saint Charles. Madam Speaker, with respect to the handling of sexual allegations against General Vance, everything was done properly. They said, "Who said that?" The Finance Minister, Prime Minister, of course, during an interview, and then he confirmed, "Far too many women and men who are survivors of sexual assault do not feel safe to come forward. That's why we need to make changes." Is that a joke, Madam Speaker? The Prime Minister has been in position for six years. How come he's mocking the intelligence of Canadian women? Sir? Mr. Speaker, our government takes allegations of sexual misconduct extremely seriously, and no one should feel unsafe at work. That's why we passed Bill C-77, Mr. Speaker, a declaration of victims' rights that puts victims at the core of the military justice system, which reviews unfounded cases. We've also created the Sexual Misconduct Response Center. We know that we have a lot more work to do, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to... Uh, sorry, Madam Speaker, we are going to get it done. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au saint charles in the same interview, when asked uh, why the Minister of Defence should keep his job, the Prime Minister said that the Minister of Defence was doing an extraordinary job. This from a Prime Minister who treated two women in his cabinet in a cal cavalier fashion and behaved inappropriately towards a female journalist and has done nothing in six years to address sexual abuse in the Canadian forces. With the bar, bar so low, we understand why his logic is so twisted. Does the Prime Minister think that Canadian women are experiencing this debacle differently? Madam Speaker, I'll let the uh, um, uh, member opposite continue on with the uh, partisan attack. We're going to stay focused on making sure that we have an inclusive environment inside the Canadian Armed Forces. And that's why we've implemented the Path to Dignity and Respect, a strategy for long-term uh, culture change to eliminate sexual misconduct within the Canadian Armed Forces. We know that we have a lot more work to do. We have a lot more work to do when it comes to systemic racism. That's why we have an independent panel also working on that, Madam Speaker, and we will get this done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg au Saint Charles. Madam Speaker, we're not playing petty politics when there are facts, facts that say that in 2015 that report was tabled and everything was there. The Prime Minister did nothing. His Minister of Defence didn't do anything either. Everyone was aware in 2018 that there were allegations against General Vance, and the Prime Minister knew nothing. Is he really taking Canadian women for idiots? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, as we stated, when any time inf information was brought forward, any type of allegations, we've always immediately forwarded it to the appropriate agencies for the appropriate action. M Madam Speaker, something that the member opposite and the former government had also d done, done as well when allegations were brought uh, brought forward. But they still appointed General Vance when there was an uh, investigation going on at, that, uh, on at that time, Madam Speaker. We know that we have a lot more work to do. It's something that we are absolutely committed to as a government. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Leftbridge. When it comes to content creation on YouTube, Canadians, they punch above their weight. Now the government wants to step in and determine who gets to be noticed and who has to be hidden, who gets to succeed and, well, who gets to lose. If Phil C-10 had been in place when Justin Bieber was a kid, just posting his music on YouTube, he probably wouldn't have been discovered because, well, his songs just aren't Canadian enough, according to this government's approval test. Let that sink in for just a moment. Why is the minister moving ahead with a bill that punishes young artists? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we're modernizing the Broadcasting Act that has not been updated in 30 years since we rented videos from video stores. We're asking web giants who profit in Canada to contribute to the creation of Canadian stories and music. This supports creators across our country. The bill will apply to social media companies only. It will ask social media companies to advise us of Canadian revenues, to contribute a portion of those revenues to Canadian cultural production funds, and to make our, our creators discoverable. Individuals posting to social media are excluded. The Honourable Member for Leftbridge. Let me clarify. When the member says that it will make certain artists discoverable, what she means is it'll move some up in the queue and some down in the queue. It'll pick winners and losers. It's sneaky, it's controlling, and it's wrong. Imagine if this bill had been in place when Sean Mendez was a young aspiring artist posting to YouTube where he began his popularity. The government's internet czar likely would have demoted him because his songs, well, they just aren't Canadian enough. So will the minister truly support Canada's young artists and cancel C-10? The minister, please. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, 
Justice Kennedy's analysis confirms that Bill C-10 remains consistent with the Charter's guarantee of freedoms of speech. And as a government, we have and we will be upholding Canadians' fundamental rights. I would like to confirm once again, individuals posting to social media are specifically excluded by Bill C-10 and to be clear on the obligations for social media companies and them only. None of those obligations would be requiring them to restrict or review posts by individuals. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Madam Speaker, yesterday Quebec introduced a bill to promote and protect French. Many Quebecers uh, have French close to their hearts, but not everyone, because obviously the Minister of Indigenous Services said that he was concerned by this bill. According to him, the promotion of our common language would be done on the backs of minorities. Yet his own government recognizes, and I quote, the special situation of Quebec in an ocean of more than 360 million mainly English-speaking inhabitants. Will the Prime Minister correct his minister? Honourable, uh, honorable. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Pardon, pardon, dit... Sorry, I had a few technical issues. I was speaking, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to clarify, of course, uh, for my colleague and for the government, protection and promoting French in Quebec and across the country is a priority for us. In fact, we tabled before this House, and for the first time in our history, we mentioned that we have to go further with respect to protecting the French fact, and that is why we are going to ensure that in our jurisdiction we're going to take our responsibility to protect French. And at the same time, the member for Saint-Jean. Madam Speaker, the question was about the minister's statement, the indigenous minister's statement, who I assume was incorrect. He thought he was defending a minority, but what he did yesterday was to take the side of the vast English-speaking majority in North America against the future of a minority language that exists in only one uh, common language in Quebec. Once again, I'd like to remind people that the only official languages whose future is threatened in Canada is French. I find it hard to believe that we still have to repeat this. And even more to a minister from Quebec, will the prime minister bring his minister back to reality, the honourable minister? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My colleague is trying to say all of this. Well, most important thing is that together we recognize that protection, protecting French is important, and we have to ensure that we protect linguistic minorities in Quebec and across the country. We have said it. We're doing this. It's not just words. We're taking action, and we're the first government federally in our history to do so. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie, Madam Speaker, Hydro Quebec is a pioneer in renewable energy, and it's thinking big. It intends to supply electricity to Boston and New York. It is a real pride for Quebec. Now we learn that. Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is putting obstacles in its way by financing a Texan gas company that is challenging Hydro-Quebec's new transmission lines. Will the government finally commit to letting Hydro-Quebec develop and thus create good jobs and reduce overall GHG emissions? The Honourable Minister. Madame la Madam Speaker, my colleague knows full well that the investment fund for the CPP is fully independent, and I hope he's not telling us that politicians should try to get involved. That's not our job. Hydro-Quebec's project, even though it's a very good one and it's good for the environment and good for Quebec, everyone's in favour of that project, I assure him. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Madam Speaker, access to clean water is a basic human right. In this country, Indigenous communities have been promised repeatedly that this would be honoured. In 1991, promised that by 2001, clean water didn't happen. This Prime Minister promised by 2021, 20 years later. Oh wait, he meant 2023. Stop explaining. The point is the promise has been broken too many times. When will this government assure that this basic human right is honoured for every human being in this country? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yeah, and I thank the member for her question. And as she failed to note, uh, there are now no longer any long-term water advisories in the province of British Columbia, thanks to the work that has been done and the plans that have put it, been put into place. Uh, 
throughout the past years, in, in, including in Semiam First Nation that, who lifted their advisory last month. Um, there is much more to be done. We continue to invest in Indigenous communities to ensure that they lift their long-term water advisories and that the safety and security of clean water into communities is, is assured uh, for more than past 2023, 2024, 2025. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Despite the nice words and promises of the Liberals, there are still homosexuals who are being discriminated against when they're doing blood donations. This ban, based on sexual orientation rather than on risky behavior, is discriminatory. Why is the Prime Minister encouraging homophobia by not keeping his word? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Ms. Madam. Madam Speaker, we agree that the blood ban is discriminatory. That's precisely why we worked and provided the funding needed to uh, HEMA Quebec as well as the Canadian Blood Services to make these changes. We look forward to them bringing forward an application. It is not a decision that the government can make on its own, but we encourage HEMA Quebec and Canadian Blood Services to make this application so that we can finally end this discriminatory process practice. The Honourable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Madam Speaker, why ban a man who has been a couple for a long time with the same person to from giving months uh, blood? Giving blood is a gift of life, and homosexuals should be able to fully participate in our society without being discriminated against because they're gay. Monday is International Homophobia Day. Can the minister keep his promise by lifting the ban and finally end this unjust discrimination that uh, uh, prevents people from giving blood. Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, once again, yes, we absolutely agree this is a discriminatory practice. That's precisely why we put in place the funding needed for HEMA Quebec and Canadian Blood Services to do the studies that were needed. Madam Speaker, I won't take lessons from Conservatives who continually talk in this House against LGBTQ2 plus rights and then have sat on this issue for more than 10 years. We took action right away and we worked to end The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Madam Speaker, the federal government has been trying to block Christopher Karras's court challenge that argues that Health Canada discriminates against him on the basis of sexual orientation because Health Canada is preventing him as a gay man from donating blood. Section 13.5 of the Blood Regulations Annex of the Food and Drug Act clearly lays out that the Minister of Health may remove the ban on accepting blood from gay men. This isn't about the provinces. This is about the Minister of Health not acting. Why hasn't she? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, once again, the decision to change the discriminatory practice of the blood ban is not one that the government can do on its own. It has to be done in conjunction with HEMA Quebec as well as Canadian Blood Services. But we want this decision to be made. That's why we provided the funding. I would actually ask the member opposite, while she sat around the cabinet table with the Harper Conservatives, why they did nothing to actually end this discriminatory practice. We are taking action and we are moving forward. The Honourable Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Madam Speaker, I'm waiting for the day that member calls me homophobic or something, but here is the absolute truth about this Liberal government. They want the votes of gay men, they just don't want their blood. They are the first people to show up to a photo op or attack a Premier or somebody else, but it is their record that is under scrutiny because of their virtue signalling and broken promises. Stop the holding lines, stop the legal proceedings, keep your promise. What date will you keep your promise and allow gay men to finally donate blood in this country? Yes, I remind the Honourable Member that I made no promises, but the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Madam Speaker, leave it to conservatives to actually say that when we agree that this practice is discriminatory and want to change it, they consider that virtual signaling. Madam Speaker, may I remind you, a member of the Conservative Party recently had to apologize for calling LGBTQ2 plus community unclean. Madam Speaker, we take no from conservatives when it comes to ending the discriminatory practice in this country. They sat it on this for more than 10 years. We're actually moving forward to end this. The Honorable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. The federal Liberal government has taken no action to end the discriminatory and homophobic gay blood ban. Health Canada is the regulator of the blood system and the law states that the health minister may remove a condition around giving blood if she determines the condition is no longer necessary. There is no scientific basis for the ban. The law states that the health minister can make this change today. Instead, they're blocking Christopher Karras in court. The minister should exercise her powers today and end it. Why won't she? Why is she perpetuating this homophobic practice? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, if the practice could have been ended simply by a stroke of the government's pen, why did that member opposite not do so when she sat around the cabinet table? It's because this process has to move forward with HEMA Quebec as well as the Canadian Blood Services. However, we actually did fund projects, more than 15 projects, to actually move forward in ending this discriminatory practice because we are actually committed to doing so, unlike the Conservatives who who are trying to clean up a mess on this file where they have made outrageous and horrifying comments. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. The Parliamentary Secretary is trying to pivot away, but it's her record. It's the ability of this Liberal government, Health Canada, this Health Minister, they can end it. She just heard how the Health Minister can end the blood ban right now, and they choose to. This government didn't promise to study it more or research or take to six years. They promised to end it because it's discrimination. She knows the answer. The Canadian Medical Association, the All Blood is Equal campaign, Canadians everywhere agree that this needs to go. Not after more studies, they want action now. What date will the government keep their promise and the court cases? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, once again, the Conservatives are trying to pretend that the process that exists does not include anyone outside of government. If government could have made this change alone, why did the Conservatives in 10 years not do so? Madam Speaker, this process has to be made in conjunction with an application through HEMA Quebec and the Canadian Blood Services. It is a discriminatory practice that we ask. And that's precisely why we've moved forward with it, including reducing the months down to three. Again, something Conservatives never did in 10 years. I take Honorable. the Honourable Member for Berthier Mesquinanger. Madam Speaker, while Quebec is introducing a bill to protect French in Ottawa, the decline of services in our languages continues. Ottawa has outsourced the COVID testing of travellers at the end of their quarantine to switch health but it's unable to offer services in French, which traps Quebecers in quarantine for up to a month before they get the results. Switch Health had already failed to manage 400 to 500 temporary foreign workers this spring. It's pretty obvious is that they're going to fail to manage the test for the whole of Quebec. When will they replace Switch Health with a French-speaking company? Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we absolutely agree that um, testing needs to be done in a safe, fast, and efficient manner in both official languages. This is precisely why we had worked with Switch Health originally to make sure that any issues were being dealt with. However, Madam Speaker, we have also moved forward with additional service providers because, again, our commitment to making sure that we get through this pandemic is ensuring that we have all the tools on the, uh, being utilized, and those tools need to be utilized in both official languages in an efficient manner. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Mille Îles. Madam Speaker, while Quebec is introducing a table to protect French, in Ottawa, the decline of services in French continues. This is the case for our veterans. In 2018, the Veterans Ombudsman revealed that while the request for services in English took 19 weeks, the same request in French took 
52 weeks. That's a one-year waiting period, Madam Speaker. Three years later, the minister admitted in committee that this inequity still exists. After three years with no results, what is he doing today, the minister, to provide services in French to veterans? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In Ottawa, we do take our responsibilities seriously, and we're going to do more to, for French, and that is why we ensured that complaint treatment was the same in English and French, and we'll make sure that the public service respects its obligations. We created a central agency to ensure the coordination runs more smoothly, and we also strengthen the powers of the Official Languages Committee. We take that seriously in Ottawa. For Charles with St. James, Assiniboia, Hedigley. Madam Speaker, violence has erupted in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Hamas has fired thousands of rockets into civilian areas, demonstrating their obvious intent to kill as many Israeli citizens as possible. This, along with deliberately setting up bases in civilian areas, using Palestinian civilians as human shields, constitute war crimes. The Minister of Foreign Affairs' statements to date on this violence have been ambiguous at best. Will the minister state unequivocally today that he supports Israel's right to defend itself, just as President Biden has done? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, our comments and statements have been crystal clear. The indiscriminate barrage of rocket attacks fired by Hamas into populated areas of Israel is absolutely unacceptable and must cease immediately. Canada supports Israel's right to live in peace with its neighbours within secure boundaries and recognises Israel's right and, in fact, its duty to assure its own security. Canada remains fully committed to the goal of a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in the Middle East, and Canada remains a steadfast ally of Israel and a friend to the Palestinians. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Madam Speaker, the UK has announced their restart plan for international travel using the traffic light system, but here in Canada, we are still stuck under the Liberals' third wave and the hotel quarantine program with no end in sight. Madam Speaker, it's not just like flipping a light off and on. Both airports and airlines will need time to get things up and running again. So when will the government do the right thing, provide some hope for Canadians, and come up with a comprehensive restart strategy for air travel? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Anybody? Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sorry, I had a few technical issues with my microphone. I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. The Minister of Transport travel, worked on many files for Canada, particularly uh, recently, and the COVID advisory uh, was to ensure a safe and efficient system. And I would be pleased to work with my colleague for what's coming forward. Madam Speaker, clearly no one in this Liberal government has had to buy a two by four lately. Even the most essential items have become unaffordable, like plywood to fix a roof or food to go on the barbecue. It's unbelievable. The Liberals' out-of-control spending is putting inflationary pressures on the middle class, students, seniors, who are struggling just to make ends meet. Why is this Liberal government forcing working Canadians to pay a hidden tax through growing inflation and the rising cost of living? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, but with respect to his assertion, I'd point him to the testimony of the Governor of Bank of Canada, who appeared before Finance Committee, who explained in clear terms that the inflation that we've seen in the Canadian economy is precisely where he predicted it would be, and is well within the 1-3% to goal. I'd remind the Honourable Member, however, that his solution to this problem, to stop government spending, would result in the government removing essential benefits that are helping support families and businesses in their time of need. Canadians can rest assured that our government will be there for them as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, unlike the Conservatives. Honourable Member for Kenora. 
Madam Speaker, Canadians have been shocked by the housing crisis in Nunavut with thousands of families are on wait lists, many, and many homes are overcrowded, in poor condition, or riddled with mold. Yet somehow, Nunavut's housing needs have been completely overlooked under the Rapid Housing Program and once again underfunded in the latest Liberal budget. Madam Speaker, why is this government so reluctant to support Northern housing? The Honourable Minister. Let me uh, first uh, correct the record. Our government has made historic investments in, in, in housing, not just in, in Nunavut, but also in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. In the Rapid Housing Initiative, uh, close to 40% of the projects went to Indigenous-led uh, housing providers. The North presents some challenges. We await the tabling of the Humor Report on, on the Urban, Rural and Northern Housing Strategy to take next steps. The Minister has engaged the Housing Advisory Council to, to create this new program, which will provide additional support for those people in the North looking for housing and in particular in Nunavut. We look forward to the progress we're making and build on the $70 billion national housing strategy, which commits to success in just this area. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan and West Kootenai. Madam Speaker, flooding along the Mackenzie River has already devastated Fort Simpson and Jean-Marie River and is threatening four more communities. Yesterday, people from nearby communities generously organized an airlift of vital supplies into the flooded towns. Meanwhile, the Liberal government's response is that they'll consider future funding requests. Will this government act immediately to help the people of the Northwest Territories who have been flooded out of their homes? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Pré Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the question. I'd like to thank my colleague. Uh, and the government is concerned about the flooding and is prepared to help the provinces and territories if there is a request. We're closely monitoring the situation in areas in BC, northern Manitoba, and actually all across the country. We are certainly ready to support the provinces and territories if they need help from the federal government to deal with flooding. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Manitoba government violated the constitutional rights of Opiponapiwin and Tatasquiat Cree Nations by approving a final license to Manitoba Hydro that includes parameters to further devastate these communities. In the past, the federal government has helped First Nations to defend their rights. This led to the negotiation of the historic Northern Flood Agreement. But what about today, in this era of reconciliation, where is the federal government? Will the federal government step in and support OPCN and TCN as they defend their rights and protect their nations. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Bueller. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Anyone? <laughs> M Madam Speaker, we take very seriously the constitutional rights of Indigenous peoples, including in the case that's been mentioned by the member opposite. I'd be happy to follow up with her at uh, a later date to get more details about the matter and see what can be pursued. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Madam Speaker, every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. But far too many people in my riding of Etobicoke Centre are forced to make the impossible choice between paying their rent or buying groceries. That's why this week I was so proud that our government announced $30.5 million in new funding to build 113 new affordable homes as part of a new project located at 75 Tandridge Crescent in Etobicoke. This new project will build affordable homes for those who need them most, including those who are experiencing homelessness or are at risk of homelessness. Could the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Families, Children and Social Development update the House on what the government... The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the Rapid Housing Initiative has been a remarkable success. In, in just over six months, we have created, uh, with a $1 billion investment, uh, close to 4,700 units of housing, housing well over 5,000 people who were previously homeless or at risk. Uh, in Budget uh, 2021, we add another $1.5 billion to Rapid Housing Initiative, and this will hopefully uh, make it even further inroads into eliminating chronic homelessness in this country, and in particular in places like Etobicoke, where the member comes from. I'll 
also add that the previous question asked about what we did in Nunavut. There were three projects under Rapid Housing Initiative approved in Nunavut, all with the Nunavut Housing Corporation. We are making a difference in people's lives. Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Madam Speaker, last week Alan My Riding received his census form in the mail only to learn that it must be completed online by this week. Alan and other constituents, particularly seniors, don't have a computer in their home. And with public health restrictions in place, they can't go to a library or a friend's house to access one. More stress for Canadians in the middle of this preventable third wave. When will this Liberal government stop leaving Canadians behind? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, thank you uh, to the member for bringing this to our attention. I'd be very, very happy to uh, reach out to her and make sure that we do take down the information and we can do everything we possibly can. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cyprus Hills Grasslands. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Farmers back home are working long hours to get their crops in the ground. Many of them have reached out to report that Stats Can workers are going around farm to farm with a 2021 census and are needlessly holding up production. To make matters worse, they show up the day before the census is due, making it impossible for it to be filled out on time. This is no way to treat farmers who are in the middle of their busy season. Why can't Stats Can send surveys in the mail on time instead of driving around rural Saskatchewan? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we understand full well how incredibly important it is to make informed decisions. We have made every effort to ensure that Canadians are aware and that this information is put to good use. However, again, I will undertake to reach out to my friend to make sure that we are doing an incredible job receiving information from our farmers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Federal leadership on this pandemic has been confusing and chaotic every step of the way. The risk is low, the risk is high. Don't wear masks, wear masks. We're not closing the borders, we're closing the borders. Canadians just want their lives back. Yesterday, the CDC issued guidance that fully vaccinated Americans can ditch the mask if they're outdoors or indoors. That is how you combat vaccine hesitancy. In Canada, we're just not that fortunate. How do the lives of half-vaccinated Canadians change? Does anything change? Is there any guidance on this, or is that too much to ask? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I... I believe we have a point of order, the Honourable Member for St. Jean. There was no interpretation for the previous uh, intervention. It doesn't seem to be working. Is it working now? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, can we ask the Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George, to uh, start again, please? Federal leadership on this pandemic has been confusing and chaotic every step of the way. The risk is low. The risk is high. Don't wear masks. Wear masks. We're not closing the borders. We're closing the borders. Canadians just want their lives back. Yesterday, the CDC issued guidance that fully vaccinated Americans can ditch the mask if they're outdoors. Uh, excuse, uh, excuse, uh... excuse me. There are two points of order. I think it's on the same point. I'll go to the Honourable Member for St. Jean. Yes, I imagine it's the same thing. There seems to be a problem with the uh, member's microphone. I'm, I'm just going to ask the Honourable Member to move his mic a little bit further up uh, because the mic is too close to the mouth, so it's uh, causing some uh, difficulties. I'll ask the Honourable Member, member for Caribou Bridge George to restart his question. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Federal leadership on this pandemic has been confusing and chaotic every step of the way. The risk is low. The risk is high. Don't wear masks. Wear masks. We're not closing the borders. We're closing the borders. Canadians just want their lives back. Yesterday, the CDC issued guidance that fully vaccinated Americans can ditch the mask if they're outdoors or indoors. That is how you combat vaccine hesitancy. In Canada, we're just not that fortunate. How do the lives of half-vaccinated Canadians change? Does anything change? Is there any guidance on this, or is that just too much to ask? 
The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, of course, every country and around the world is looking at life post-COVID, and Canada is no exception. We all want to return to normal. Um, Madam Speaker, our government's been working hard with provinces and territories to provide the best science and evidence-based guidance. In fact, Madam Speaker, we will have more to say on this later today, but I want to remind Canadians that the best way to get through this pandemic is to keep signing up for vaccinations and to follow local public health measures. The Honourable Member for Lévy Latbinière. Madam Speaker, the fight against violence against women is a critical issue that requires political action and decisions. Those decisions must be made by all leaders in the House of Commons and the other place without partisanship. Madam Speaker, will the government support and promote swift passage of Bills S-231 and C-293 by the end of this session of Parliament? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Everyone has a right to live free of violence, and our hearts go out with everybody who's been impacted by this. Our government is fully behind the uh, the 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 address to end and and support our our plan on um, national action plan to end gender-based violence. Our investments alone support over 1,500 organizations that deliver essential services to end gender-based violence. We will work tirelessly to end gender-based violence. The honourable member for Avignon, Amitis Matan Matapedia, Madam Speaker. Quebec has tabled legislation to protect French. Meanwhile, in Ottawa, the decline of services in our language continues. It's true of the RCMP. It takes a long time for an access to information request from the RCMP. They're hardly a model of transparency. But it's worse in French, as was recently reported in La Presse. An official admitted that most of the people only spoke English. Only a handful of staff could deal with requests in French. Will the government do something to ensure the RCMP treats francophones with the respect they deserve? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Madame la Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, indeed, francophones have, are entitled to the same respect as English-speaking Canadians all across the country, and that's why we've decided to reform the Official Languages Act. It's an ambitious reform which will ensure that the public service has more resources and tools to ensure that institutional bilingualism is implemented and respected, and it'll be a pleasure to work with colleagues on that. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Madam Speaker, Quebec has tabled legislation to protect French. Meanwhile, in Ottawa, the decline of services in our language continues. The current Act requires federal departments and agencies to report on their progress, but half of them don't even do it. They would rather break the law than report on what they're doing to promote French. So the Liberals uh, are all fancy talk, but what are they doing to enforce the current legislation? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It goes without saying that we are enforcing the Official Languages Act, but at the same time, we have to give the Act more teeth, and that's why we've decided historically to undertake an ambitious reform to create more tools to enforce language rights in Canada, including the protection of French as the minority language. And that's why I look forward to working with my colleagues and the President of the Treasury Board to ensure that the Act is enforced. And I hope that we will have the Bloc's support when we table legislation to modernize the Official Languages Act. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dauphin Swan River, Nipawa. Uh, Madam Speaker, over one year later and the illegal occupation of the Lake Audi Campground in Riding Mountain National Park continues. This oc occupation violates the National Parks Act. However, Parks Canada has failed to act and instead deprived Canadians access to a national park. Barricades, vandalism, theft and prohibited use of cameras are only some of the consequences of this illegal occupation, not to mention numerous safety hazards. 
Why has the minister failed to end the illegal occupation in Riding Mountain National Park? The Honourable Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, certainly, uh, it's an important time for Parks Canada as we begin to reopen for, uh, for the coming year. And it is important that uh, all Canadians have the ability to access our parks. This is an ongoing issue, as the Honourable Members know, as we have discussed this in past. It is something that we are working through to try to find a, a mutually acceptable and appropriate solution to this, uh, this ongoing challenge. The Honourable Member for Dauphin Swan River, Nippewa. Madam Speaker, that's not good enough. Documents reveal that local law enforcement raised public safety concern many times to Parks Canada and that conflict has already occurred. We now know that there is no plan to fully reopen Lake Audie Campground. If public safety is further compromised because Parks Canada refuses to act, the minister will be directly responsible. Why has the minister ignored public safety concerns and failed to ensure that many. all Canadians can safely enjoy their national parks? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Smith. Speaker. As, uh, as I indicated before, public safety is uh, of the utmost priority to, uh, to this government and I think to all members of this House. This has been an ongoing challenge that we are working to resolve. Uh, it is important that this is done in a thoughtful and constructive way, and that is exactly what we are doing. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in my region of Canada, the forest industry needs help from this government. They are facing an epidemic caused by mountain pine beetles. The species destroys many acres of pine trees every year and are expanding east, causing damage along the eastern slopes of the Rockies. The mountain pine beetles in Jasper and Hinton are a genetic mix of the northern and southern mountain pine beetles that are stronger and more destructive. Madam Speaker, will the federal government take action to reduce the population of this harmful invasive species? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we are working closely with provinces and municipalities to help slow the spread and migrate the impact of forest pests in Canada, as well as reduce the risk of infestation in areas that are not affected. Our government invested $20 million annually in scientific research to address the risk posed by our forest. We remain focused on science-based solutions. We will continue working with our partners and invest to protect Canada's trees from infestation. The Honourable Member for Chateauguay-Lacolle. Madam Speaker, the Lac Megantic rail tragedy is still etched in the memory of the community and all Quebecers. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transport update the House on any progress on the rail bypass and our government's support for the people of Lac Megantic? The Lac Megantic. Merci. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Chateauguay-Lacolle for her important question. We are working tirelessly to support the members of the community of Lac Megantic. This week, our government repeated its commitment to complete the rail bypass project by 2023 and to keep the community apprised of developments. Work is to start in the weeks to come. We will do everything in our power to see this project through to completion. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Madam Speaker, Sonari's has been an Edmonton favourite Italian restaurant for over 30 years, but since they reincorporated in 2020, they did not qualify for the federal relief programs. This business has lost its vast customer base due to a hollowing out of downtown Edmonton caused by this government's slow vaccine rollout. Stats Canada reports over 200,000 jobs lost in April alone, and Zanari's may soon add another 20. Madam Speaker, will the Prime Minister admit that he has failed businesses like Zanari's, who, if they, if they were south of the border, would be fully back in business? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, with great respect, our government has put a series of programs in place to support households and businesses from the very beginning of this pandemic, and that's why so many have been able to survive the storm. We've even made changes to so many of the programs, including certain businesses that have had a change in ownership. But with respect to his assertion about vaccinations, I would remind the Honourable Member that Canada is currently third of all G20 countries in terms of the rate of people who've actually taken their first dose and is vaccinating Canadians faster than citizens of any other country. 
country today. I'm looking forward to this summer and joining some of the businesses and restaurants in my own community, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member of St. Albert, Edmonton. Madam Speaker, my constituent, Abby, opened a restaurant, the Flame Kitchen, just before COVID. Since then, he's been unable to draw a wage, and the restaurant is at risk of permanently closing. And yet his business has been completely shut out of the government's COVID supports because of a failure to include new businesses. For a government that claims to have Canadians' backs, why after 14 months does this government not have Abby's back and the backs of new business owners like him? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, at the outset of this pandemic, we moved forward with a suite of policies that were designed to support as many businesses as possible as quickly as possible. In order to protect the integrity of the systems that we've put in place, we used the revenue from the year prior as a comparator to ensure that we were providing funding in a targeted way to help businesses survive. Going forward, there is a number of programs that we put in place that are encouraged to help businesses keep their doors open, hire new workers, including new financing programs that are available for businesses to invest invest in themselves and purchase that new piece of equipment. With respect to new businesses, we're going to continue to look for solutions to support those so they can help contribute to the recovery going forward. The Honourable Member Desnete, Mississippi, Churchill River. Madam Speaker, it has been over a year since the start of the pandemic. While other countries are emerging from this crisis, Canada is in the middle of a Liberal third wave. Conservatives have consistently asked this government to provide a plan with benchmarks and targets for reopening so that businesses and families like those in my riding in northern Saskatchewan can get back to normal. Last week, the government of Saskatchewan announced their three-step reopening roadmap that clearly laid out a plan for the people of Saskatchewan. Madam Speaker, where is this government's plan? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, it's important in the middle of a public health emergency that is global in scale that we do not take our eyes off what is most important. We need to continue to support Canadians through the ongoing public health emergency that the COVID-19 pandemic represents. I'd remind the honourable member that during their time of need, we supported 9 million Canadians with CERB so they could keep food on the table. We've helped 5.3 million workers keep their job with the wage subsidy, and over 80% of the money that's been spent to help Canadians get through this pandemic Pandemic has come from the federal government, including through the Safe Restart Agreement to help Canadians enjoy and succeed in their communities during this pandemic. We will continue to be there for Canadians as long as... Member for Guelph. Madam Speaker, we know good things grow in Ontario. The adoption of the environmental sustainable practices in agriculture is a priority for our government. We're proud of the Living Laboratories Initiative, bringing together farmers, scientists, and other partners to develop, test, and share innovative agricultural practices and technologies. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food tell us about our role in protecting important waterways and conserving soil health in Ontario? The Honourable uh, Minister. Madam Speaker, our government is investing $4.2 million to launch a living lab in Ontario. This will be the fourth of its kind, following similar collaborations in the Atlantic, Prairies, and Quebec. Their research will focus on reducing runoff from agricultural land into Lake Erie, improving water quality, conserving soil health, and increasing biodiversity. Those are the tools farmers need to set the stage for tomorrow's agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Skeena Balkley Valley. Madam Speaker, news that Greyhound is ending service in Canada is a huge blow for rural Canadians who depend on the bus. But it's more than an inconvenience, it's also a safety concern for Indigenous women and girls, for seniors, for students, and for Canadians who don't have their own car. Instead of ensuring services, this government stood by and did nothing for years as Greyhound cut roots. They've allowed rural communities to be left behind. No more half measures. Will the minister commit to a national passenger transportation strategy that serves all Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Merci, uh, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a disappointing decision. We know that many Canadians depend on this mode of transportation and that industry has been hard hit. We have provided support, including through the wage subsidy, and we will be there to support the transportation industry in future. Thank you. Vancouver Granville. Speaking 
to the UNDRIP legislation today, the Justice Minister said that um, in terms of 262, if it wasn't delayed in the last parliament, the government be working on an action plan for its implementation. Let's not kid ourselves. The fact is this government delayed the important work of true reconciliation due to political expediency. Over five years of promises, very little action on rights recognition. C-15 is a small first step. Will the government stop making excuses, do its work, get its own house in order, change its laws, policies, and operational practices to ensure Indigenous peoples can be self-determining? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we take very seriously the issues that relate to Indigenous reconciliation and UNDRIP. We thank the member opposite for her contributions when, uh, in her previous role as Minister of Justice in this matter. We know that the government stood behind Romeo Saganash's private member's bill in the last parliament, which is unfortunate in the fact that it did not secure passage due to Conservative opposition in the Senate in the last parliament. That's why we've tabled C-15. That's why we're working with opposition parties to secure the passage of C-15. That's why we're very keen to see UNDRIP see the light of day and achieve royal assent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And that brings us to the end of question period this Friday.